We now have our last session of the day, Heritage Engineering, a conversation with GCC. Can you hear me? Murtaza Valley, who's a critic, curator, editor, and visiting instructor at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, is going to be talking to GCC, which is a delegation of artists critically engaged with politics, business, diplomacy, and corporate branding in the Gulf. I can't wait. Um, they say their softly subversive and critical artistic practice is best exemplified in their exhibition GCC, Achievements in Retrospective, which debuted at MoMA PS1 and also showed at the Sharjah Art Foundation. The delegates are Nanwal Hamad, Khalil Garabali, Abdullah Al Mutairi, Fatima Al Qadiri, Munira Al Qadiri, Aziz Al Qatami, Barak Al Zaid, and Amal Khalaf. And welcome. I'd, uh, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, the organizers of the Global, uh, uh, the Global Art Forum for uh, inviting me to uh, moderate this uh, conversation um, and for uh, this beautiful venue for uh, hosting the event. Um, <clears throat> I, I seem to have the uh, amazing honor and privilege and incredibly daunting task of uh, moderating a conversation with all eight members of GCC. Uh, and I think this is the first time that this has happened in, in previous panels and conversations. Um, a few people have always been missing. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. We've been allotted a fair amount of time, so I think it'll, uh, I, I think we should be able to cover a lot of material, uh, but um, we'll see. Uh, so I'm gonna sit down with them so that I'm not hovering over them. And they seem to have uh, made themselves at home, which is very good. Um, Take a second. But um, the group's actually prepared a, a, a slideshow presentation of their works, which will kind of be playing in the background. And as we, uh, as works come up in our conversation, we'll, uh, we'll address them. Uh, but otherwise, we are not, it's not going to be a kind of like illustrated lecture type of conversation. Uh, the idea uh, is more to kind of really engage the group in the conversation, take advantage of the fact that all eight of them are here, try to get kind of their unified vision, but then also a diversity of their voices. Um, and maybe poke and prod at some uh, uh, weak spots, no, not weak spots, sore spots, I don't know. Uh, so just to get started, uh, uh, you've been introduced to them. They're a group that uh, has been in existence for uh, a little over two years. And they have, and they have done uh, very well for themselves in those two years. Um, and um, <coughs> They produce work that, uh, uh, in their own words, one of their primary objectives is to uh, uh, represent the contemporary conditions of the Gulf. And uh, one of the things that will come up in the conversation is precisely what they mean by contemporary conditions and what they mean by the Gulf. Um, and you guys will get a sense of what their work looks like uh, as uh, it scrolls by. Um, and, uh, but I, uh, before that, I, I, I want to start off with um, asking them about uh, the unique nature of their multidisciplinary and collaborative practice, uh, how exactly a group of eight people uh, communicate, work together, produce objects, uh, and uh, produce a discourse around those objects as well. Uh, so I'm, I'll start off by turning to all of you guys, and uh, if you guys can talk a little bit about um, the sorts of things that brought you guys all together as a group, uh, maybe we'll start there and then we'll move on to how you guys actually function on a day-to-day -day basis. We had started out, um, we've known each other for a long time. We've been friends and collaborators for a while. Um, we had been working together in small groupings for the past uh, eight to ten years. Um, and we came together for a proposal, the Seven Kuwaitis, um, which we had submitted for a project um, that didn't go through. Um, but we still wanted to see it through. And at that point, we had invited Emel uh, and Safi Maria, which was at our Dubai uh, 2013. So our two-year anniversary is next year. Uh, I mean, next, next week. week. Um, but that was so, sort of how we joined together. Mm -hmm. it's a, I, I, I always forget that little bit of uh, your uh, institutional history that actually the origins of the collaboration was from a a failed project, a project that was never realized. And then you guys took it upon yourselves to realize it. Uh, uh, so can you talk a little bit about how a collective of, I guess, before nine, now eight people, how, how exactly you guys work uh, on a day-to-day -day practical level? It's a 24-hour conversation. <laughs> 
So we use all uh, the available tools to us, like email, chatting, Skype, Ovo, whatever, all these different platforms that we use to communicate um, from morning till night till morning. And it, depending on the time zone, there's like conversations happening in the middle of the night, you wake up, and then it, it just continues. And it, it's kind of this never-ending conversation that we have together, which obviously wouldn't be possible without the existence of the internet. <laughs> But I would, I would add that the most important or like generative moments for us are when we uh, come together physically. So that's why it was really important for us to have, since we were all going to be here, to all be present and physically together for this talk with Murtaza. Um, but those, we, we call them summits. So we're the GCC, we're kind of taking on some of the... Um, uh, the uh, the aesthetics and the uh, rhetoric, the language, the visual and, and the written and the kind of pervasive language um, that surrounds us in the in the Arabian Gulf, um, and so so we call them summits, but they're not overly formal events. They're just the moments when we come together, and so we've actually been summiting the last in the past week since we were here. Um, but we do have, like Manira said these ongoing sustained conversations. And um, yeah, it's uh, just like echoing what May and Manal were talking about before. Technology kind of like lets it happen, but it doesn't necessarily make it easier. It's always better when we're all together. Yeah, but I think also uh, being in a collective and having so many, because we, we all have different practices, uh, other, other work we do, um, other lives somehow. <laughs> can, can you guys just uh, quickly go down and uh, say what your day jobs are? So that people have some sense of the variety of uh, expertise and disciplines that you guys bring to this like rich practice. Do you want to start that in? Uh, sure. Um, so should we also say our names? <laughs> should we do that? <laughs> go down the roster. Um, in addition to being a member of the collective, I am also, uh, I write and I, I curate, I organize exhibitions. Um, I'm a music producer. And my name is, my name is Barak. <laughs> uh, my name is Fatma Al-Qadiri. I'm uh, a music producer mainly, but um, I've also have been um, working in visual art for several years, but um, with Khaled Al-Gharabelli and, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm Abdullah Al-Mtiri, and I'm training to become an art therapist in New York. <laughs> But you're also an artist. <laughs> I'm also an separate artist. from GCC. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Munira Al Qadiri. Um, I'm also a visual artist, uh, and I studied in Tokyo for ten years. <laughs> um, I'm Aziz Al Qatami. I can't hear myself. Uh, I'm an architect, and I've been working with Fatma Khaled Nanu in art uh, for a few years before joining GCC. Uh, my name is Khaled al uh, I am currently fully devoted to working with GCC, so no, no day job, but... Um, He's the only full-timer. And like Fatma said, um, we collaborated previously as a duo um, art practice. Hi, I'm Nanu al uh, I'm an object designer and artist. Uh, I'm Amal Khalaf, and I'm a curator and an editor. And, and um, once you realize this and then you look at their work, uh, you see the fact that uh, a lot of these practices are reflected in the, in the aesthetics and the rhetoric that the work itself dis uh, deploys. Um, so maybe moving along, um, we'll uh, um, shift gears a little bit, and I actually wanted to talk a little bit about the, the title of the, uh, the conversation. Um, for, for the title of the conversation, I used a, a phrase, heritage engineering. And it's a phrase I encountered in a book by uh, um, an Arab study scholar based at Duke University named uh, Miriam Cook. And it's the chapter heading of a book that she recently published called Tribal Modern, uh, Branding New Nations in the Arab Gulf. Uh, the book is somewhat problematic and uh, uh, is also somewhat provocative and has a lot of interesting ideas about how these new nations are being formed uh, and um, uh, imagined um, and projected uh, in this region. Um, but I was really struck by this, this term, heritage engineering. Uh, the more common term used in heritage studies 
uh, and I'm not an expert in heritage studies, so don't ask me any details, but uh, the more commonly used term is heritage construction. And I thought heritage engineering marks uh, an interesting shift that shifts this discourse of heritage from uh, kind of like geared towards the past, maybe almost an industrial past or a, a pre-industrial past even, uh, to kind of a more contemporary moment, to our moment of the digital age, to the moment of uh, information, of the internet. Uh, you know, it's, an, it, it's, a, it's a construction that re resonates with other forms of uh, kind of like contemporary technology or um, uh, use like genetic engineering, biomedical engineering, uh, you know, the engineer of archives, of databases, of algorithms. And I just thought it was a really provocative term. Um, and I threw it out there to these guys, and I wasn't sure if it would stick, but uh, it seems to have resonated with them in some way. Uh, so I, I kind of want to shift the conversation a little bit uh, towards this idea of heritage and uh, ask them uh, if it is something that they've ever thought about uh, and if, if it is something that comes up in their work. Uh, and if so, in what ways? Um, that it resonated with me because I think a lot of what we do as GCC, it, GCC is an acronym. It, we're inspired by the Gulf Co Cooperation Council, but it stands for any really um, major structure of power that uh, exists in the world, and that can be arts, government, it can be all of these different things. Um, but related to that question, I think what's interesting in the Gulf is that there is this, um, especially with the construction of nation states, there is this kind of campaigning or construction of a heritage that does use all of these things that we, we use, which is um, visual language and text and all of these different things that constructs a narrative that might not have been there, but is very convincing. I think uh, a, a lot of the work that we do um, is related to um, the, the a visual language that, that we've all grown up with and seen develop that's so pervasive in day-to-day in -day life in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what we do is um, thinking about maybe troubling that or reflecting that in a way, putting it through certain filters and representing it again. And um, it's really, uh, I think, a lot of the images that we do are part of this visual language, the engineering that's happening around constructing identities mm -hmm. and thinking about the future, but all, also holding on to uh, kind of pre-approved, preset images of what it is to be here. And also, um, I have to add that we um, are interested in the very contemporary way that nation states are employing the language of business and corporate culture into uh, the language of the nation, which I think is something that is quite new and is being heavily used uh, in the Gulf. And uh, this kind of marriage between um, uh, business and countries, I think is, is very interesting. Um, yeah, something that we're constantly um, talking about. Yeah, and it, it kind of enables us to talk about the structures or systems that govern and organize our lives in, in the Gulf and, and outside the Gulf. So, um, you know, heritage often gets collapsed with identity, it gets collapsed with history, it gets collapsed with all these things. I, I personally don't feel like it resonates with what our work is quote unquote about. Um, but it's a way, and I think what struck me about using it as the title was that it was a way into the kind of very jargony um, space in which these, uh, you know, these structures of power manifest. You know, the, the, the country as a nation, as a corporation, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And we, we kind of play with this idea, we don't have images up here, but uh, I'm gonna plug our show right now that's <laughs> at the Sultan Gallery that you can see tomorrow morning and Monday morning. Um, but it's really, uh, it, has, it does deal more explicitly with that idea of um, engineering, um, engineering heritage or engineering identity. And um, <clears throat> the, I mean, the issue of um, representation and perception uh, in the Gulf and about the Gulf is a crucial issue for us. And uh, I feel like this is a sort of, you know, a controversial, problematic issue uh, 
especially, I feel like uh, it's a more of an acute issue in the Gulf more than other places. Um, so now, now that people have kind of gotten a sense of some of the work uh, on the slideshow, maybe you guys can identify a few of the sources, or maybe not the sources, but the type, the types of uh, the types of image uh, databases or libraries or uh, uh, um, uh, image stashes that you guys are drawn to and draw from. Um. Um, one of the major, I think, sources of inspiration or uh, places of exploration is diplomacy. And diplomacy is really, you know, it's a global phenomenon with a history, and it has mutated over time. Um, and we're really interested in diplomacy um, as a performance, as a theater. Um, as a repeat, as something that ha is shared across the world, even though, let's say in the Gulf with the Micro Council, this is something that's, let's say, indigenous to a GCC summit. But this is something that is, uh, this is one object that has, that can be read in different ways um, as a performance object, you know, that activates mm -hmm. this summit. And the language of diplomacy and the performance of diplomacy is very, you know, is a one major source of exploration for us. And also um, stock images <laughs> that are heavily used in branding campaigns and corporate campaigns, and uh, you know, um, and sometimes we create original images that people think are photoshopped or stock imagery, but we actually made them. <laughs> in Switzerland and places like that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, these, uh, well, global summits, they happen in places like, for example, Davos or something, and it's in a very luxurious atmosphere and lots of handshaking and beautiful scenery and very nice food. And what really gets achieved in those places? So uh, I think we use uh, langu the visual language of the Gulf that uh, reflects these things, but are, these are really global uh, questions that people, I think, should start asking. And I think that we're doing that through art. And uh, I, I would just add to that there's, that there's a great amount of love and attention and care that we, we give to these, these images as, you know, as you're um, asking us to kind of talk about, talk about them a little bit more directly. So I think that's important to, to highlight as well is that not only, as Emil said, did we kind of like grow up surrounded by this and like are living in this visual culture, but we genuinely like are fascinated and, and sort of en entranced by it. And so want, want to use it, want to use it as the raw material for our work. Yeah, I think what we were trying to say is that um, the impact of images, that what they have on our lives and the repetition of certain images and what they say, um, especially uh, how there's such a formula to perpetuate a certain idea to look official you have to have these certain things and you can easily achieve that with Photoshop or photos or anything so it's this performance of images that do have a huge impact on how you perceive us as a group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another thing about especially talking about di diplomacy and the imagery of diplomacy is uh, it kind of stops there uh, here in the GCC you don't get um, past the surface um, so especially with the Swiss Summit photos, we were trying to reimagine what's happening behind the scenes and beyond what we were just given because that's all kind of behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, sort of like uh, it's our perception of, you know, sort of what happens behind the scenes and offering access to it, but through our filter. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, that's the way I was actually thinking about micro council as well, mm. um, in that the. The shift in scale, uh, microconsole is a, a, a table that was used in uh, recent summits of the GCC, and uh, I think two summits into, in 2013. Um, and the group actually found, uh, through their research, found uh, uh, images of the, of the table and then had it recreated uh, on a fairly small scale. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about what, that, what, the, the, what the shift in scale might mean, and I think one of the things it does do is that it allows this form that is otherwise inaccessible to become much more accessible. You can actually come close to it, you can look over it, you can study it. Um, it really does make it, um, you know, give, 
opens it up for uh, a broader audience to in interact with. Um, yeah, and that work in particular has lived in a, a few different settings. So if you've seen it cycle through, um, it was um, exhibited in relationship to the massive cityscape we called Amalgamated City. It was um, uh, exhibited in Sharjah uh, at the Sharjah Art Foundation against um, a work called Toposilia. So the, like we, within our own work, play with scale and also the repetition of images um, uh, that we create. So constantly trying to think about the own context in which we're creating things. And if you think of scale, or sorry, mm, if you think of scale of how something is planned and the actual planning of a city, there is, you see that it isn't really, it doesn't happen that way where things are planned individually and then they're put somewhere. Like I know recently there was a building that was built and then they realized that there wasn't an elevator shaft. So it's things like that where the actual um, place isn't really taken into consideration. It's just an image of what someone wants. Uh, also, this idea of repetition that Abdullah mentioned is very important. That uh, it's not just also ju just these objects or designs or influences or in, in, for example, the table, but also uh, performance and ritual. So these rituals that get uh, repeated over and over again, and why are they important? So important in the Gulf. For example, ribbon cutting. We have this fascination with ribbon cutting because it's extremely important in this region. And even if you open a major exhibition or a building or a supermarket or your son's little uh, playground, or you the have Andy Warhol exhibition. You have a ribbon cutting ceremony. So where do these th things come from historically, and and why did they mutate into this like very official language? So for example, we found out that ribbon cutting comes from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and you know things like that. And how did these things? manifest themselves here. So we also look, try to look at history through, through what we do. Um, so um, like I mentioned uh, very briefly in my very brief introduction, they're a group that hasn't been around for very long and they've had um, a, a quite a, a speedy ascent uh, into the uh, kind of like up, maybe not upper echelons, but somewhat upper echelons of uh, the international art world. Um, so I actually wanted to ask the group themselves to uh, maybe reflect a little bit upon why this is, uh, whether their work resonates some, in some way uh, beyond the region. Uh, maybe it resonates some way with uh, trends or zeitgeists that are current uh, um, more globally. Uh, one of the ones that has been kind of bandied about is, uh, is, a, is a term that's gaining traction and is getting better defined in an international contemporary art uh, discourses, and that's post-internet art. But I was just wondering whether there were other um, things that you guys think that your work resonates with that allows kind of, that maybe has enabled this uh, uh, real uh, quick uh, ascent or exposure. Um, I think that a lot of our work deals with really global issues. They're just dressed up in Gulf clothing, mm -hmm. but these are really just you know, diplomacy, like I said, diplomacy is a, is a, uh, a global issue. It is a, a global performance of um, power systems at work. But there is also this idea between the public and private sphere, and this is something that we seek to collapse in our work, you know, with the micro council uh, bringing it to a touchable scale. Uh, with the Swiss, Swiss summits, delegates dressed in pajamas shaking each other, so they're... they're uh, publicly performing in private attire um, against non-powerful uh, non backgrounds, uh, the, the, the mountains in the middle of the grass. You know, this is not a very dignified area to perform a handshake or exchange a trophy. The idea of achievement and awards is a, also a global phenomenon and overbearing in the Gulf, you know? I was just going to say, in, in the different places we have shown our work there, um, for something that seemed so so local or specific, for example, the congratulations series that we have, um, where where um, which was first shown here in our first solo show in Sultan Gallery, 
um, the first solo show we ever had, which was um, in 2013. Um, uh, the congratulations were produced for that show and, and were seen here by Kuwaiti audience. And then um, I remember an amazing conversation we were having in PS1 when we took them to New York, where many, many people that worked in, in the finance, in finance in the city uh, in New York, they were coming up to us and just talking to us about this idea of patriarchal systems and corporations and this this constant need for reward well, and neoliberals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 One of them said his office was drowning in lucite. <laughs> very happy to see this on, on the platform. But it was great to be able to engage in these conversations about uh, about power and pa patriarchy, for example, in in that context, and to be able to to really engage with people that might not have seen that conversation emerge in in an art setting. I don't think they were imagining that's what they would come to see when they came to see us. And I feel like you're trying to also address a sort of generational issue of like, you know, the art post-internet. And there is a running theme in post-internet art is the sort of like corporate, uh, corporate culture as a, as a common theme amongst a lot of artists working that are our age. And um, for us, like um, Munira was mentioning earlier, um, this sort of like neoliberal merge of corporation and state is so crucial for the Gulf and for the subject matter and the detritus around this issue that we're so fascinated by. I feel like that that's a link that people are seeing, but it's not so much, um, you know, uh, theme, uh, thematical links like, you know, the, inter the internet or uh, uh, a certain aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of us being post-internet, I think, would only relate to our process more than anything. Because but, our process is internet-based, but I don't think that our practice or themes or ideas uh, are really connected to that. But even, I was gonna, I was gonna say something about process, because I was also thinking about the way that we make things, mm -hmm. too. Because, um, I mean, some of the things do look very digital and glossy and, and what have you, but some things like micro council table was actually handmade by somebody in Gibraltar. And um, so, you know, we have, uh, I guess we, we, you know, because of our different backgrounds, because of our different experiences, and also because of the content that we're dealing with, we are also interested in, in the different processes and um, at times like using like, the, the actual processes of that, that are used by, you know, for example, with the portraits that we made um, that were exhibited, um, uh, they were exhibited as part of a wallpaper installation at the new museum in the lobby where we um, uh, depicted ourselves in, um, in you know, traditional uh, garb in Gathra Agal and um, we all kind of, uh, uh, had it, we, you know, we, we stood in for those portraits, but then the portraits were actually painted by uh, the man who paints these sorts of portraits for Chiuq. Um So, like, getting as close to the process as possible is, is also really important, and I don't identify that with post-internet art. I don't, uh, you know, it doesn't resonate with me. In term. general, any, someone said somewhere on the internet I read, any artist working now is a post-internet yeah. artist, so it doesn't really matter. True. Um, so I want to come back to something that Amal touched on briefly, which is uh, something that I, I think thus far hasn't been uh, discussed a lot in relationship to your work, but I, I think plays a very important role and uh, merits a, a little bit further discussion, uh, and that's about the role of gender. Uh, your work often gets read in terms of either this kind of like a discourse of appropriation or then about this kind of uh, uh, a deconstruction of, uh, of the rhetorics and aesthetics of power and of diplomacy in the region. But I was wondering whether uh, any or all of you uh, wanted to talk a little bit about how you approached uh, issues related to gender. I mean, I think something that Fatima said in passing about this relationship between public and private uh, hits on that uh, uh, pretty, pretty closely, pretty precisely. I mean, all of us really, the majority of us have been working with, um, in our different practices with the idea of gender. And um, 
It has to do with the role of patriarchy in the in the region. You know, we we it, it's it's our very subtle way of like inserting a, a subversive message without making it crystal clear. You know, although it is crystal clear, and it's something that a lot of people actually didn't pick up on. Um, for instance, in the new museum, we were dressed as men. Um, Khalid and Abdullah were were dressed as, as female secretaries for um, delegates. So, but it's something that just kind of like went over the head of uh, certain critics, which surprised us. But I'm glad you asked the question because it's something that is uh, something, you know, it's part of our work also not to be very direct, although I, I guess this is pretty direct, but to try not to be too direct with uh, the way that we present subversion or um, or questioning of systems, you know, we want to we want to present it in a kind of an oblique way. I but, think. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I guess also because we're eight people, um, the the underlying interest has to be kind of unanimous in something. And it doesn't really mean that we're all on the same page about this subject, but we're really interested in it. In in the same, we have we're fascinated by it. Some people love it, some people hate it, some people think it's uh, critical, some people think it's positive. Some, t you know, so uh, I think we try to use this kind of body of eight people um, to tackle subjects, but not always looking at them the same way. And I think that's what makes the work expansive and, and interesting and thought provoking. Yeah, but we don't, I don't, at least for me, we try to not approach this work at, with a moralistic view where we're trying to present something with a very simple, like, this is good or this is bad yeah. approach. Um, and I think in the Gulf, especially with the topic of gender, there usually seems to be a very crystal clear idea that's behind it and that can be a bit dated. I think it's more subversive to just present something in a way where it isn't central, it's just part of um, the work. And in, in another respect, um, we're players in this, in this theater, and in theater, it doesn't really matter. It's just whoever fits the part plays the role sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another part is where it underlines this performance and that it isn't about one person fitting uh, a role. It's about that play, the, the, the theater of it. I mean, to some degree, the gender is always performed performative. Or yeah, it's ritualistic, it's performative. We could all be men, we could all be women. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I, I, I completely forgot what I was about to say, um, which I, invariably happens to me once every time I do this. Uh, it'll come back to me. Um, give me one second. Uh, oh, so I, I was going to um, ask about... Um, you guys, in, in your own, own, own ways and your own languages, have touched on uh, a certain ambiguity that I think is central to both the success and possibly a critique of your work. Um, and in, in kind of like preparing for this conversation, I was thinking about uh, maybe commonly used art historical models that could be uh, used to uh, kind of think through their practice. And the two that came to my mind um, one is institutional critique because so much of the work is about uh, infrastructure, about institutions, about bureaucracy, about nation states, um, and about collectivity and collaboration as well amongst you guys. Um, and then the other one was pop art because there is this kind of like uh, almost uh, uh, objective and almost uh, uh, like exhilarating uh, um, appropriation of what you see around you like popular visual culture uh, that's kind of taken up and then reproduced and represented and uh, performed uh, in, in kind of like a very simple, non-judgmental, non-moralistic way. Um, and then I was beginning to wonder whether maybe, uh, maybe the best way to think of it is kind of as the bastard child of these two <laughs> very different practices. Um, and so the question actually is, is that, do you think that bastard child is something that maybe is indigenous to this part of the world and hence it works well. I don't know how indigenous it is. I think that, you know, there are two things. The one thing that is very pop is the corporate relation to the to individuals and to the state. To the state is less, let's say, uh, pop. To the individual, it's much more pop across the world, across the art world. Uh, the one that I wouldn't say is so pop is diplomacy. 
the exploration, diplomacy as a subject is very stale and we're very interested in staleness and how the stale language just keeps getting, um, I mean, the, the Gulf representations of diplomacy have their own special kind of pomp and etiquette and uh, performative elements that have been ongoing, just you know, mutating slightly over the years with uh, materials, let's say. But they've been fascinating to us and uh, also as a collective working as a body in, 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 this, in the guise of a government body slowly dissecting this, one, one aspect of the work is dissecting this very stale, I would, I would argue non-pop subject, you know? Mm. Um, is, yeah, this is one of the, I think one is, one is the pop, one is not pop, yeah. you know? And people, people do, I mean, so that's, that's the pop art question, then the institutional <laughs> critique side um, question. I mean, um, I think we, we individually and as a group have very strong views and we articulate them to each other and we struggle to discuss them with each other and it's really um, enriching and I've learned so much um, from these seven other beautiful human beings. Um, and so I, I find it really interesting when we do... Um, hear people or um, when uh, a writer comes in and says, well, is this work critical or is this work actually affecting any kind of critique or is it manifesting any kind of change in the paradigms you're introducing? And I think our work is a little bit um, outside of the kind of what is sanctioned by the art world as uh, acceptable critique. It's a beautiful phrase that Emel put in my head earlier um, uh, that I've just been kind of mulling over. And so I think that that's something that, uh, you know, that's something that I find really interesting and I'm, you know, I'm wondering, Emil, what more you might have to say about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we were just discussing this earlier and, and even earlier in this week and, and just thinking about um, um, expected forms of, of representation of critique. And I think that also we, we should talk about being, you know, being here in the Gulf and what that means and what, what, how the art, how art is seen in this function in general and even what critique means in the art world itself and, and what, what discussions there are, who's, who, who, who are make, who's making these critiques, what critiques are allowed, how there's, they're expected to manifest somehow. And I think that, that those are things that we, we do play with and think about in, uh, in individually in different ways and, and together in our work. And I feel like this comes back to the issue of perception because a lot of um, the sort of major uh, sort of criticism or critique of this region is coming from the outside looking in. And again, so there's like these, uh, these issues at play here that are really sort of connected to that. I really, I really see, you know, um, a lot of the work that we do or the way that we talk about our work is these, we're creating these, these mini worlds or these mini, these interpretations of uh, a world that we're inviting people to, um, to inhabit and question and challenge and problematize. Um, we work, we tend to work in a very immersive way. Yes, we do produce a lot of individual objects and, and um, things, um, but we, tend to create a setting for those things. And I think Amalgamated City is a really um, great case in point of that, and the installation we did at the New Museum, um, it's, it's, it's a, a kind of, uh, yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, with critique, like Khalid was saying, that most critique that we're getting is about perception and about sort of outside looking in and perception of us as from the Gulf and how that is seen as some sort of privilege without really knowing us personally, I think. And with artists in the Gulf, it seems like if you, you're not so direct and talk about your struggle, or any really artist of any sort of perceived minority, if you're not talking about this struggle narrative, then you're not being authentic or you're not really, or you're privileged and you're abusing your privilege to appropriate lesser, perceived lesser classes, but that isn't the case. And I think it is a struggle for some people to perceive our art as a performance and a critique and not a representation of just bratty Khaliji kids, you know. 
Um, I'd like to pick up on that and maybe take it a, a one one step further. And um, returning back to this book that I mentioned, uh, the the tribal modern. One of the other interesting things that she she talks about is how uh, a lot of the nation states in the Gulf um, are similar in certain ways in the way they approach uh, their uh, heritage from the past. Where if you'll see across the across the Gulf, a lot of the same icons or uh, elements from the past kind of get picked up and then get uh, turned into um, heritage, get celebrated as, as, as cultural heritage, as authentic cultural heritage, and then finally get branded and circulate as brand, as nation, as nation state brand. Um, but then she also says that, you know, at the same time, there is also this struggle between the different countries in the Gulf to kind of uh, differentiate themselves uh, as being distinct from one another. So there's a simultaneous weird move where there is a similarity in language across the Gulf, but then also this like desire or impetus to differentiate. So I was just wondering that since you guys do uh, say that you represent the Gulf, uh, I was wondering if you guys as a collective could talk a little bit about this relationship between sameness and difference across the region. Uh, and I know that in our conversation earlier, Amal had some strong words about this. Well, did we say that we represent the Gulf? Well, that you're from the Gulf. Yeah. Sorry. My mistake. Those are two different things. <laughs> just to clarify. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that, like, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting because this sort of uh, pulling at, I don't know, I forget the expression, but it's like, you know, all, all these uh, uh, Khaliji countries trying to highlight uh, minute differences between each other to stand out and the sort of competitive nature is a very contemporary issue because the initial conception of the GCC in the 1980s obviously was to counter Iran after the revolution. Uh, a lot of the rhetoric, rhetoric that they were using back then with the, these sort of regionalist pop songs and you know television shows and things like that uh, the theme was, you know, if you listen to the lyrics of the songs, you know, Khalijuna Wahad, Masiruna Wahad, which is our destiny is one, we are one people, this is one place, and, you know, there's no room to maneuver this, uh, uh, this monolithic uh, grouping. And then I feel like over time this idea has been sort of disintegrating. Yeah, I think, I mean, that this work behind us that you can see right, uh, sorry, this work behind us that you can see right now. Uh, that actually has that soundtrack playing. That's the soundtrack. The song Khalij Nawahid is the soundtrack playing amongst the, the projections of uh, fireworks on, on this uh, imagined uh, amalgamated one city. Uh, but, but the city is filled with icons, these super sky skyscrapers that have and have not been realized. So it's, it's made up of those. And I think those are kind of symbols of something that you might have been talking about. But I think also there is this idea of this, this need for a hum, uh, to be able to be read and projected to the outside world as having this homogenous image um, to the detriment of like an extremely varied and heterogeneous actually <laughs> a grouping of the world and, and also whatever relations have come before and how they were created and manifested from, from colonial histories. And I think that, um, yeah, there, is, there, is, there are different ways that these, these moments can come out in our day-to-day -day language, be them top-down or otherwise. I think that, yeah. Yeah, I think what also part of what we try to do in our work is to uh, exaggerate or accelerate that official narrative. Okay, so if we are really uh, one people and one culture and one place, then what would one city look like? Or what would one song sound like? Or what would uh, this kind of uh, extra unified <laughs> gulf look like? Um, so this is something that we, uh, and I think this idea of acceleration and exaggeration is very important part of our practice. <laughs> Dystopian utopia sort of thing. <laughs> So, um, uh, I guess that brings me to another question that uh, I guess has, uh, has been lingering at the back of this conversation. And I'm going to use two terms that you guys used. Uh, um, and one is excess, uh, acceleration or exaggeration, and the other one is staleness. And I want to bring in the idea of time or time lag uh, and how that relates to your practice. Because another one of the reasons why I was uh, selected as the moderator for this uh, um, conversation was because um, 
Um, my partner and I have been conducting uh, um, a series of uh, uh, seminars at, at uh, Campus Art Dubai, which is an informal art school that is an offshoot of, uh, of the art fair. Um, and the theme that we developed for this year, for this region, or I guess for uh, Dubai specifically, uh, is the idea of, of slowness and how it relates to issues of how one experiences time, how that affects attention, and finally how that relates to the construction or the engineering of heritage in the region. Um, and we were actually set up as maybe being counterpoints where you know I was all about slowness and they were all about like the speed of now. Um, and the more I think uh, I thought about it and the more we've actually gotten to know each other a little bit, we realized that there's actually quite a bit of overlap and you guys are not necessarily as, as speedy as we would like to think. <laughs> Um, so I, I, w I was wondering if I, you guys had anything to say about staleness and acceleration, maybe the relationship between the two. That's exactly where I was going to go. <laughs> I'm so happy we're on the same temp temporal wavelength. It's, yeah, it's the hair. Um, well, you, you referred to um, a, uh, a book, a text that you kind of visited or revisited during, um, during your own sessions um, with Campus Art Dubai on slowness. And if I remember correctly, um, the definition that that author um, gave to slowness is being particularly attentive to the, the, the spatial uh, arrangements. Is that, is that sort of close? Like there's, there was a certain amount of attention to... Yeah, th the idea is that, um, that, that slowness is actually not something that is in opposition to, uh, to fastness right. when it comes to how we think about the present. It's actually a, a, a mode of like situating oneself in the world where one can be attentive of all of the spatial and temporal complexities of a particular point. Yeah. And that is something that slowness allows for. Um, it's also related to Giorgio Agamben's writing about the con what, what makes something truly contemporary. Something that is truly contemporary is something that is both in step and out of step uh, with the present at the same time, so. Yeah, I think, I, I think the others probably have a lot to say about this, but I just wanted to introduce the, the term dithara in, onto the table because we do talk about it a lot um, in relation to our work and in relation to the Khalij. Um, so maybe somebody else can pick, pick that up. So I think dithara is equally uh, decadence, deterioration, rotting, uh, staleness all together kind of thing. <laughs> And we, we uh, atrophy, atrophy, <laughs> <laughs> and we really like those aesthetics. I don't know. There is there's something. Uh, the Sara is a. It's a it's a reality present in certain institutions in the Gulf, um, and there it has its enemies and it has its proponents. But it's something that is goes hand in hand with um, bureaucracy. You know, it is part of the bureaucratic system, and it's Dithara can be found in any country in the world. You know that it's the uh, desire to stop movement. You know, <laughs> and um, I think that this is something that's that's interesting between the the different um, Gulf nations and between Emirates within Gulf nations that there is a very major tension between people that want to speed up the neoliberal um, agenda, for lack of a better terminology, uh, and nation state branding and, you know, these moving forward a kind of a corporate enterprise, um, which is quite recent, I think, in the history of the region. Um, it's, it's happened in kind of bursts between the 70s after the, the war in Kuwait, the mid-90s, etc. You know, it's been happening in these, like, there is a timeline that you can Visit, revisit, you know. Um, so this is there is a very interesting tension between accelerationists and atrophyists in the region, and this is a really uh, very interesting temporal struggle between the two, you know, that we are visiting in our work. For instance, uh, um, in section this bureaucratic office with. Uh, the detritus of what you find, and if you go to many different uh, bureaucratic offices in the region, you will find this kind of like uh, moment frozen in time, literally, from the 80s or from the 70s that has not 
you know, <laughs> been, been touched. You can taste the dust <laughs> in the air. <laughs> um, and then there's the other side of these uh, just like f mushrooming like fungus of buildings and skyscrapers, which is the antithesis of the, of the Sara. No, I just wanted to highlight some of the things that Fatima highlighted and that, that there's a sort of, you know, there's a dual nature to the Gulf. There's, um, you know, there's this sort of ancient culture and the sort of neoliberal corporate um, aspect to it. Another thing that is inter inter interesting with things that are stale is that, like we are saying earlier, it has to be repeated so often and has to be accepted by a group for it to actually be stale. And that is interesting in itself, is that it's something that's so, it's like seen so much that it's not interesting anymore. But it is interesting. So I, I'm going to ask another question that actually comes out again of my experiences uh, with, with Campus Art Dubai. But um, could, uh, could you guys think of slowness as, or staleness or atrophy or the Arabic word, which I didn't catch? Uh, Dithara. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to see it written out. Um, as, a, as a way of uh, uh, like gaining or uh, achieving some sort of criticality or uh, maybe even resistance. Because uh, in, in, our, in our course, we also had, uh, had the students read uh, uh, Laziness in the Fertile Valley by Albert Kosseri. Uh, but we had, it, had them read it as, a, as, a, as, as maybe a text on resistance so that uh, once the bureaucracy gets so strong or so big, uh, the only way you can resist it is by, through inaction, not through striving for action. Um, and so you have this family of, uh, of, of kind of peasants in, in Egypt uh, and all the men in the family just sleep all day. Uh, and the youngest one is struggling to kind of fight that sleep and kind of engage with the industrialized world or industrializing world. So I was wondering whether that has maybe any traction or any resonance in your practice or uh, the things that you've studied or the things that you've uh, researched. Um, absolutely. I would say, I mean, slowness ties in with Dathara a lot and, and especially with the peace section. Um, it is a visual byproduct of this like lack of productivity and this plateauing of bureaucracy. Um, and that's something that's extremely prevalent in the region that you can see all over. Um, and that's something we're interested in. And as Abdullah was saying, it's something that becomes so uninteresting or so um, sort of visually prevalent that people have forgotten about it. And now we're revisiting it and, and exposing it and putting it under a microscope once again. I'm interested in the idea of resistance, and I think the res it's the resistance to agency. That's how I would put it. You know, that non-action is a resistance to agency. It is a resistance to responsibility. Um, and I think this is, you know, I wish it was a resistance to uh, the wholesale, like, capitalist destruction of your nation, but it's not. It's, it's merely a resistance to to agency and responsibility. I think that that's a realistic uh, evaluation of that. Yeah, I mean, I love the story about the sleeping farmers. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly, this inaction is action is exactly what we're doing, I think. <laughs> but I think it, it, our work actually is very active, even oh, though yeah, it, it, disp it displays, it's like pretends to sleep sort of thing. <laughs> you know, or it takes a picture of them sleeping. It's like something like that where it's pointing out the inefficiency that is happening, yeah. um, basically. Yeah, I, 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 thought, I thought that was great thinking about this idea of, of this uh, resisting re responsibility, but then it's really, really like a very, very active giving over, <laughs> handing over uh, <laughs> of power, I think, as well. And that's something that we... The idea of resistance also is very interesting because you have um, in the States a very obvious countercultural uh, counterculture and how that is perceived as resisting, but is it really? So it's just this perception of what is, re what is resistance and what isn't resistance and what is um, just ignoring a situation. Yeah. I mean, there is, like, like we mentioned earlier, there are sort of sanctioned versions of how things should be, and I feel like if and that's where you know sort of it gets problematic with our work when pe when it doesn't fit within a sanctioned way of dealing with things. Um, so we we could go on for a while, uh, as we did over lunch. 
Uh, but we have about, uh, we're amazingly on schedule, uh, and we have about 10 minutes left, so uh, I wanted to maybe open it up to the audience for questions. No? No? Oh, five minutes, sorry. Five minutes left. Uh, so I wanted to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, I was wondering, because you say you're sort of subversive but obliquely, if you could affect some sort of change as a collective, what would it be? Culturally, politically, socially? I think there's a long list. <laughs> I, I don't know if I would be so selfish to want one change, you know, but... Um, yeah, it's a bit difficult because I think everyone yeah. has... I think it's more about, well. you know, raising awareness as easy. I, I think mostly it's being aware. Like, we represent a lot of <laughs> cliches, and uh, by just placing these cliches or events, a lot of people are getting in contact with, um, with things that are repetitive in their daily life, but without understanding it. And by them knowing that, it's quite important to us. Um, one, of, one of the ideas of slowness that this author, that Lutz Kopnik, uh, uh, developed in the text that uh, I was talking about was precisely this, where uh, repetition or slowness allows for you to like jog yourself out of uh, a routine or in, his, in, in, in other cases, maybe the like fast flow of the contemporary. One can get caught up in that and that's what people think is contemporary. So if you're constantly Instagramming, if you're constantly Twittering, if you're constantly updating your Facebook status, then you are contemporary. But slowness is something that allows you to kind of like take a moment and like extract yourself out. And often through a repeated repetition. So ritual becomes very important. Uh, yeah. Since uh, this is, uh, I, I understand it as a sarcasm, the whole work. And uh, all the artistic expressions they, they express this massive thing that you have inside, but then similar to all the works, this work and all the work that you do, what do we do about it? Because we are a part of it and we realize it. I mean, I cannot think of a solution to get out of this. And you individuals, how do you get out of it? My dressing <laughs> uh, I think it's the same as like a writer writing a book you know, it's the only, I think expression is kind of like a tombstone in history, you know, uh, should someone want to investigate it. Um, I think it's the only thing that you can do. It's better than being silent, you know. It's, it's a way of meditating on a reality. Yeah, it's, it's a reflection of, of, of what we live in. It's, it doesn't mean that it has to have a solution or an action or an immediate effect. There's just it's uh, just to reflect on your life and what surrounds you. I think is important without um, wanting it to result in something. I don't know. But I do think that um, the importance of the image today in in the Gulf and and uh, used by the powers that be be them in the state or in all these massive, huge corporate structures that cross cross regions and cro that that we all live in, in all the places we 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 live in and, and experience. I think uh, the use of images um, and to uh, and and also the role that art and cultural institutions play in in the uh, exercising or manifesting of power. Um, uh, here and elsewhere um, is what makes bringing these images back into those spaces. I don't know. I feel like there is something there that happens there. What do we do when we bring these kind of images into the gallery? Yeah. And these are questions that we're asking ourselves. I mean, as Murtaza said, um, you know, it's it's been two years, and so part of what we're doing now is slowing ourselves down and trying to think about our own process, trying to think about and consider that that kind of a question is like, what is the work doing? What is it, what, you know, what m meanings is it creating? What, you know, things is it meditating on? But also, um, how else do we want to work with it? Where, where is the element of liveness? Where is the element of uh, interaction? And how are we using it? Because it does come up in the work. It does, there are ways in which we implicate the viewer, in which we transform the space, in which we transform ourselves. And I think all of these all of these factors are really charged. Really, you know, they have a, a, a strong transformative potential. And so, part of our conversations and you know having a summit together this past week is talking about 
you know, what's next. And so it's something, it's a world that we can imagine together. Yeah, and also I have to say that I think what we're doing came out of kind of a sense of urgency. There was an urgency to create these images. Uh, they didn't exist before. No one was addressing them. Uh, we felt like there was a need to reflect them in art, in artwork, in museums, in wherever. And not just for the audience, but for ourselves also. And, um, and yeah, and so, I mean, slowness is important, but slowness has been what we were living with for a long time. Um, so I think the speed was, was a good factor to start with. <laughs> Uh, whether that will continue, I don't know, but, uh, but there was an urgency to address these issues. One final question. Hi. I'm just wondering if um, you guys have started an archive or a repository of uh, all of your ideas, conversations, artwork, so you know, never know in 100 years' time someone would like to write a PhD on, on, on your work. Just wondering if that's uh, taken place. Yeah. Um, that's something we're currently working on. Um, again, we've been around only for two years and we've done quite a bit. Um, so we haven't had the opportunity to um, really think about these other things. Um, even like a website, is, our website's very, very minimal. Um, but we were just discussing this and this is something we want to um, do uh, in the near future. But um, since our beginning, we, we've been on WhatsApp and that's been our main uh, source of communication. We have GCC and GCC Casual, <coughs> which is the more fun, sort of uh, random stuff. And then GCC is very serious. But um, we've also just realized that this entire um, conversation since March of 2013 has been archived. Um, and that's Actually, something... I haven't saved. <laughs> I haven't saved as a text file. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, and that's something we were talking about um, because we're, we're kind of in this moment of, of um, reformatting um, and uh, that's something we want to do ourselves is go back and, and consider all of those things. Um, but we're working on it. Tori, it's a Can we have one more question? It's, it's kind of an um, eager one. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, it was Slavoj Zizek somewhere said that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. <laughs> and um, just thinking along the lines of this conversation about acceleration and slowness, maybe we can see the, 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 the simulated acceleration in your work as being the end of capitalism, as, as being that vision of capitalism. And by end, I don't mean the finish of capitalism, but perhaps um, stretching it to its end limit of our imagination. And therefore, um, to, to, of course, abide by slowness and to, to see the possibility of resistance and slowness, of course, we, we all empathize with. But there's probably a resistance in the acceleration that you simulate. Uh, I wonder if you have thoughts on that. <laughs> okay, so we have a video called Co-op where we kind of self-aggrandize what we've been doing for the past, uh, at that time it was one year. And we, made, we blew it out of proportion and we flew like we, we created these images where we're flying to China and all these things and, and our work is exploding all over the world and, and then we go into a train and then we go into outer space, you know, and it was like the end of, <laughs> end of like this crazy speed that we're, speed train that we're running through, you know, and, and really I don't know where the, the end point is, but we have been trying to imagine it, you know, and we've had our, our trophies spinning on pedestals so that they would reach a state of nirvana. <laughs> um, we're trying to find that end point. I mean, outer space, nirvana, I don't know what it is, but we're, we're trying to find it. <laughs> but we've always been outdone by actual corporations and governments. Yeah. They have way bigger budgets <laughs> and different intentions. It's all about achieving transcendence through uh, branding. Um, but I, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah, no. I, w I, I was just going to say that I, it's been an incredible honor to actually uh, have this uh, um, uh, opportunity to, uh, to uh, interact with these guys and uh, engage them in a conversation. Uh, they made my job easy. All I had to do was ask a few questions, and there are like eight incredibly uh, articulate and intelligent individuals, and they uh, made it very easy. And I'd like to thank again the Global Art Forum and our hosts here in Kuwait for uh, a really lovely evening of programming. Um, and I would like to thank the audience uh, also for your attention and for your questions.
Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.